Sandy and Corey from Monroe Life just had an excellent interview with Ford leadership. Here are clips that I found to be the most valuable from that interview, as well as my thoughts around the implications for Ford and for Tesla. The tipping point that some people talk about, 5% has been hit, and the projections from the different um, uh, are telling us that that 25% uh, of the people that have been canvassed about their next buy is electric. It's got to be exciting and terrifying both at the same time. How do you move fast enough in order to, uh, to keep up with what I think is going to be uh, the biggest rush for a different type of vehicle since the uh, Toyota invasion in the uh, in the 70s. We, we didn't really understand, in the case of Lightning, how attractive the non-EV propulsion parts of the vehicle are going to be. The frunk, the power, pro power on board, those kind of things have really propelled the vehicle into like a different space. We should challenge ourselves to not look at these products as just a propulsion change, especially the software we ship to the vehicle then the reasoning is, why wouldn't I? It's faster, more reliable, less expensive to fix. I got a huge interior space. I think the burden is kind of on us to break through on the product side. Uh, we'll see what the customers do. We, we can scale. In this clip, Ford seems to understand the wins of having a well-packaged EV. It's not just about the battery and drivetrain, but it's about everything else that you can do in an EV. They also recognize that it's up to them to execute this, that it's not just a given that just going EV is going to enable them to do this. They have to execute. However, it seems that they were surprised by this, even though they had data points around Tesla's success in the marketplace. This points to them not really paying attention to the market. And even though they've recognized how much better an EV is compared to a gas car, by saying this publicly, they've opened the door to Osborning themselves away from gas cars into EVs without having enough supply. The biggest challenge for our team Edison when we formed it four years ago was credibility within the company. We had people who weren't sure that an electric F-150 would work, and if it did, if it was less profitable, why would we want to sell a lot of them? And we had a lot of skepticism about the range. We knew how big and important this was for the company, the opportunity. There were a couple of outspoken people outside the company who said, you need to electrify F-150. Uh, buses were going at that point. There was no competitive reference. The Cybertruck was nowhere to be found. There was no market data that said, go do this. So there was naturally people going, hmm, Really? In this clip, it shows that Ford chose the right direction, even if they were going to make less money, which means that they really understood their fate was super dependent on them going towards EVs. But again, saying that there wasn't enough data points out there for them to make this decision shows that they weren't paying attention to what Tesla was doing in the marketplace. Actually, it's the first time I'm going to mention it, but there's a push by, by many of the people who already own EVs, not necessarily Teslas, but other EVs. And they're trying to get the standard move from what we have now, the SAE standard, to the Tesla charging port. Have you guys ever entertained that or thought about it or what have you? One of the biggest priorities we're focusing on right now is um, is charging. Uh, and I think we take the responsibility for good charging experiences really heavily. I tell the team it's not just that you gave a bad experience about Ford, you gave a bad experience about EVs and that's a really big deal. So yeah. we have a very high gain on charging experience and we're working really hard to figure out all the things we can do in public charging to make it better and we'll consider everything including oh, that. In this clip, it's clear that Ford views Tesla as a market leader, especially from a charging perspective, and they're willing to work with Tesla, which is absolutely excellent for their success. They also recognize that it's super important for EV adoption, which is a great customer trust builder. It's not just for Ford, it's for EVs in general. What's happening in China and the way that the EV digital products are coming to life, which price point, and that being the biggest market of the world. And now you see them exporting to Netherlands and Norway. You know, it's just a matter of time before we have to face music that in the end of the day, our fitness is going to be, you know, at all different price points. We're not going to get into details, but uh, this is really important for our global competitiveness. The fact that Ford recognized that China's upcoming market rush is happening is a good sign for their survival, since it shows that now they are paying attention. Well, you're in second place right now, right behind Toyota, or sorry, Tesla, I should say. 6.2% yeah. uh, of the market share for EVs anyways belongs to you. But I also know a whole lot about the Chinese. Like there's a, uh, you've probably seen the curve, connect the dots, uh, the value of death. I had one of those, but I didn't have the same data that they had. So that's the thing that scares me the most. When the United States decides to turn, any war we've ever been in, when that thing moves, when the needle moves in a new direction, every American wants their stuff like right now. It's like somebody flipped a switch. There's no dimmer. 
it's just on or off. So mm -hmm. that's the thing that I'm the most concerned about. Do you, what, what keeps you uh, awake at night? The, the most important thing is to set up the company so we have the scaling capacity to 2 million in the next you know, four years. Two million is a really aggressive number. We only make, well, last year we made four million, four and a half constrained by chips. Normal year, six million, let's say. That's a third in three and a half years. Then we have 60 assembly plants in the world. Just think about what changes just the assembly side will go through. So I think the pressure I like to put on myself, frankly, is that we have a lineup of products once we get the capacity secured to do that. They're good enough that in total, there is plenty of customers to get us on that path. And we have learned from first cycle products that it is not a given that if you make an electric vehicle for the United States, it's gonna sell. That burden is on us to have the raw materials, the battery capacity, all the al capital allocation for the engineering, all of that stuff lined up to get to 2 million units, and then go back to the basics and nail the product and the software and the electric architectures and the semi-autonomous features. Get all that done so that 2 million is not a problem from a demand standpoint. In this clip, Ford shows that they understand how hard it is to scale a car company and they know that they have to scale. It's important for their survival. However, the key thing here is that 2 million units being produced in the next four years for Ford is being painted as a behemoth task. This, in my opinion, puts to bed any arguments around legacy being able to just switch on factories and pump out units. Any bare arguments around this have now just been debunked by a legacy automaker. The only thing I would recommend is vertical integration. I'm a big fan. So <clears throat> you're going to have a lot of um, union folks that you're going to have to take care of um, somewhere along the line. Either they're going to get a buyout or they're going to get something and you've got a whole lot of plans. Maybe it's the time to start thinking about how does Ford get back into businesses that they used to be good at and uh, get rid of some of the offshoring, make it onshoring. We know for sure that the guys that are in first place are definitely not going to get caught with another chip shortage. Given how fast and, and how many things that we have to work on. The key is to pick them strategically. Where, when we vertically integrate, can we either give something that's a lot better to the customer or where can we make sure that we can do the scale? So the reason batteries are at the top of that list, obviously, are we can't get electric vehicles to everyone um, unless we can get deep into that supply chain. Getting into drive units, you know, maybe the most important vertical integration right now you can't see, which is software. There is such a thing as a software factory, right? Yeah. And the traditional auto industry has taken their software as part of hardware and transplanted into the vehicle. So one of my biggest focuses on, on vertical integration is really the software factory and getting that up and running for Ford. In this clip, I feel that there is a lot of weak verbiage around vertical integration, and it's really being highlighted as something that is not a core competency for Ford. However, highlighting software as being the most important is a positive, but using verbiage like up and running shows that it does not exist yet. Well, we kind of touched on the software thing. Uh, the one deal that a lot of people are, myself included, are getting kind of anxious to see is, um, is an ADAS system that'll get us to level four. Have you got any, any projections on that? Autonomy is really important. Giving people time back is like the ultimate feature. <laughs> when I was working at Toyota and I, I quit to go to Ford, I sold my Prius. I had the HOV sticker and it saved me maybe five minutes a day on the, uh, on the 405 to get home. I was shocked. I didn't even know this. When I traded in my car, I actually had bought it from Toyota. My Prius was worth $5,000 more than a Prius without the sticker. All of them are worth $5,000? Yep. So that's the cost that people are willing to pay for five minutes a day. And what if we give people 45 minutes a day? Holy smokes. Talk about, you know, the killer software that we can ship to a car and unlock value for customers and create a lot of value for the company. The light bulb went off. Jim telling us the story about his $5,000 HOV sticker really outlines just how valuable full self-driving is. And it's the first time that I can recall a company outside of Tesla really underscoring this. This, in my opinion, is the first signal from legacy automakers that confirms Tesla is going towards a path of insane demand and profitability with full self-driving. And we were talking about one of the things that Elon Musk said, and he said that there's only two car companies in North America that never went bankrupt, Tesla and Ford Motor Company. Maybe I'm optimistic, but that sounds like a, an open invitation to let's get together. Have you guys ever thought about um, getting closer with uh, with Tesla or is that a 
I'm going to leave that one to you. <laughs> there, there are always possibilities with a great company like Tesla. In this clip, the fact that Ford is willing to work with Tesla shows that one, they recognize them as market leaders. And second is that Ford is willing to make the right decisions to ensure that their company survives. You know, Sandy, I, I have to say it's like no baloney. You have done so much for our industry. You have opened so many eyes at Ford and across our industry. You have helped all of us get healthier. Your team is terrific. And is it comfortable? No, but it's completely critical for our sufficiency and success is to have someone like you and your team who is the arbiter of what really is happening. Um, so I, I, I just want to say that because I know all of us feel at Ford feel that it's a it's a tribe that we're looking at this transition. And there's some people who stuck, you know, stuck their head above the parapet and said, this is not right. This could be better. Um, and, you know, that's super important for us as leaders in our industry. And I think you deserve all the credit you get. One more. That's why we're here. Wow. That's wow. why we're here. Wow. Well, uh, <clears throat> thank you. Thank you so much. I'm, I'm <laughs> yeah, it doesn't take, uh, okay. So uh, anyway, um, our, our getting, I'm now I'm flustered. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. So anyways, thanks so much. I really appreciate you all. And um, as Corey would say, uh, please subscribe. Thanks so much. <laughs> Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye. -bye. Bye.